Um, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the last panel of this uh, spring seminar. Um, we have today three, uh, in this last panel, we have three researchers who are going to present three very interesting um, uh, presentations. We're going to begin with uh, Mariel Barton um, from the University of La Lausanne. Uh, which is going to present uh, uh, some of her research on firm representations of spiritualism, which uh, will be later published in her upcoming book. Thank you, and I give the floor to Mariel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, do you hear me, everybody? Is it okay? Okay, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, very much uh, to the organizer to give me the possibility to contribute to, to this uh, seminar, even if it's only uh, through my ghostly online Zoom presence. It is an occasion, uh, it is an occasion for me uh, to present some results of my research on film representation of spiritualism, which uh, will be published in my upcoming book, uh, Le Medium au Cinéma, Le Spiritisme à l'écran, a book that will be available in June in free access. The following questions served as a point of departure for this study. How can one explain the elective affinities between cinema and spirituality? Why do both critics and viewers at the beginning of uh, cinema insist so much on the spectral character of film images? Under what criteria does cinema become a vehicle for fantasy linked to communication with spirits? Jose Bertolo gave us yesterday a very comprehensive paper, very good paper also uh, analyzing the, the issues underlying the spectral ontology of cinema and photography. And on my part, I will answer this question a bit differently by taking as its starting point not so much the figure of the ghost, but that of the spiritualist medium thought as a media, an idea already present in the written sources of the spiritualist movement and also explored by other scholars, especially in the English speaking world, such as uh, Murray Leader or Geoffrey Scans and so on. The main idea for me is to adopt a historical perspective based on primary sources by showing how filmic representation rework the spiritualist imaginary of the medium, an imaginary informed by implicit or explicit discourses on recording and reproduction technologies. Given the etymology of the term medium, we can consider this figure both as a human channel between the world of the living and that of the dead, and as a device for receiving, recording, and transmitting data. This double semantic level is brought into play within films in which the spiritual medium functions as an, um, a sort of audiovisual device, almost a cinematic apparatus capable of intercepting invisible waves, abolishing spatial distances, superposing temporality, and overcoming the physical decay of body and objects. Occasionally, the spiritualist medium sets in motion a kind of multimedia show around which a few recurring characters revolve, believers and skeptics, protective or avenging ghosts, evil spirits, parapsychologists, and so on. Therefore, only a small gap separates the spiritualist medium from the technological media, a gap that contemporary films willingly bridge, even if this means dismissing the former in favor of the latter. That's why I would like to highlight here the shift from the medium as a machine to the ghost in the machine. My plan for this presentation is um, first to present part of the conceptual framework I used uh, for, uh, to examine uh, the spirit medium as a media, and then illustrate the latter with a short case study drawn from Brian De Palma's The Fury. The conclusion will widen the, the perspective towards more recent movies, 
where, as exemplified by the G-horror, the technological media replaces the spiritual medium. The concept of the spirit medium as a communication media is not new. It is as old as the spiritualist movement itself, which is profoundly fascinated and influenced by the history of modern technology, but this fascination goes both ways. Indeed, while modern technologies such as uh, the telegraph fascinate the spiritists, the discourses on recording and communi communication technologies insist in turn on underlining the supernatural powers of such devices. And we can think, uh, for instance, uh, about the phonography. Going back at least to the time of Aristotle, the term medium is highly complex and polysemic, referring alternately to a milieu, an environment, a super sensitive human being, or a vacuum for transmitting a message or information. Born in the United States in the mid 19th century, spiritualism seized on the notion of medium to describe a person capable of communicating with spirit and more precisely facilitating more than others, the circulation of the fluid needed for the operation during a seance. A fluid thought as an electrical substance, many times. One eloquent example um, uh, of this theory of uh, communication are statements that characterize medium as telegraph operators. Much more than a simple journalistic metaphor, the notion of spiritual or psychic telegraph became topical in spiritualist writings from those of Alan Kardec on. According to Alan Kardec, spirits, I quote, act on the medium as the telegraph clerk acts on his machinery, unquote. The formula pers persisted well beyond, as illustrated by a series of articles published in uh, 1920s by Henri Azan, an editor of La Revue Spirit, under the title Wi Wireless Telegraphy and Mediumship. In these articles, the medium is presented as, I quote, an ultra-sensitive detecting organ receiving images from the spirit or the person who consults the medium, while the seance is described as, I quote, a vibrating system with its own frequency that must be harmonized to achieve good results. The dual conception of the medium as a sensitive organism and recording tool shows that his or her capacity are not only photographic, but also audiovisual. This is why spiritualist literature sometimes compare the medium to a cinematograph insofar as the medium can manipulate temporality and space, reach the past and future without hindrance, enjoy the gift of ubiquity, and more generally, reach the intangible. The physician Eugène Eusti describes the work of a clairvoyant, Mrs. M, as images, I quote, that project themselves on the screen where her hallucinations lie intensely, unquote. She then attends, I quote again, the cinematographic parade of a whole line of phenomena linked by causality, unquote. A parade of which she's both the spectator and producer. In Camille uh, Flammarion's opinion, I quote, certain apparitions seem quite frequently to be some kind of projection, a projection of animated telephotographs of cinematographies, unquote. Discourses such as this, which highlight the qualities of receptivity and automatism of the spiritualist medium, were supported by fantasies of creating, ah, sorry, I'm a bit late with my PowerPoint. That's Camille Flammarion and here my, my microphone. 
Um, all these discourses were supported by fantasies of creating devices capable of communicating with spirits, as illustrated by uh, Edison's famous spirit form, or as we call it with my uh, colleague uh, Philippe Baudouin, uh, necrophone. As uh, uh, I give you another illustration, uh, less known, uh, a certain Félix Raymond dreams in the pages of uh, La Revue Spirit of a psychic telegraph that allows to, I quote, manifest themselves without the medium being involved, thus putting an end to the risk of animism and auto-suggestion, unquote. This device is based, I, I quote, on the substitution of a metallic medium for the human medium to make the presence of the spirit even more striking while compensating for the deficiency of sight. Technology then offers a double benefit. It allows one to see as the medium does, but above all, to see better than him or her because the human body is always limited. It is therefore no coincidence that the character of the medium is portrayed in the film themselves as a media transmitting all kinds of messages from the simplest when he or she lends his or her voice to a spirit to the more complex when the process becomes a projection of images and sounds which takes the form of a sequence. The figure of the medium as a machine for making images and sounds finds one of its best expressions in Brian de Palma's uh, film, The Fury. The film, this movie, uh, thematize, uh, thematizes the vulnerability of a uh, person who have special uh, powers of mind, such as precognition, clairvoyance, or telepathy, and who uh, become uh, the target of technocrats eager to exploit their abilities for political purposes. Reflective of uh, the political paranoia that followed Watergate, the Fury recounts how members of the US government seize particularly sensitive young people to beat the Soviet on the field of psychic espionage. One of them, Gillian uh, Belaver, volunteers to attend the Paragon Institute, a center for parapsychic studies. There, the director, the Dr. Jean McKeever, explains her the theory of the bioplasmic universe, where there is a record of every human impulse, word, and deed. Seen from this angle, the vision of subjects with psychic abilities results from a connection between this timeless bioplasmic universe and the physical world. This theory is put into practice a little uh, later in the film when Gillian stumbles while walking up the stairs of the Institute and seizes Dr. McKeever's hand. And I would like to show you the clip if, it's, if it works. Too graceful. <laughs> This gesture triggers a vision in which Rabin, a gifted young woman, uh, man, sorry, who attended the institute shortly before her, 
is chased up and falls out of a window while trying to escape his pursuer, one of them, uh, who, who is uh, McKeever himself. Occupying the entire frame, the vision of the past takes the form of a 360 degree projection that circulates and wraps around Gillian, who is in trance, and you see slow motion, the lack of speech, and rather dark lightning help to distinguish these images from the frame narrative. It is as if Gillian had captured an episode of McKeever's life stored in the bioplasmic universe and projected it onto a virtual screen, a mental screen. Uh, Gillian is therefore both the source and receiver of his uh, of this mental projection. Recalling the immersive and panoramic system that encompass the spectators in the representation, this visionary experience places the medium at the center of an image that is at once internal and external. This vision even literally transcodes transcode the psychometric force theory, another theory, that Dr. Ellen Lindstrom exposes to Gillian earlier in the film using, fittingly, a cinematic metaphor. The challenge is to extend one's own electromagnetic field by imagining an empty movie theater where the screen becomes a projection surface of thoughts reduced to the lowest frequencies, namely alpha waves, as you know, associated to, uh, with uh, relaxation and meditation. The fury makes particularly obvious the mediation work to which every medium lends itself with a body becoming a sensory and communicational envelope in which different, <clears throat> different spaces and temporality converge. At once, subject and object, rational and occult, modern and primitive, masculine and feminine, the medium appears in this fiction as a reservoir of images, sounds, and sensations that can extend beyond his or her own body. But these precognitive or retrocognitive perceptions also come, come at a price since mediums often suffer a lot from their visions and in this respect, they become machines overloaded by excess of information and communication, such as Johnny Smith in Dead Zone. In any case, the filmic representation of mediumship update in a very effective way one of the achievements of spiritualism, which elevates the human organism to the rank of a privileged media fostering a series of exchanges between the tangible and the intangible, the near and the distant, life and death. And in this way, we can say that the medium is a kind of hypermedia. As can be seen in many contemporary films, the medium tends to disappear in favor of the media, or at least is integrated into devices such as computers or telephones, which have become the main site of the supernatural since the 1990s. Although technological devices have always been invested with spectral properties, we notice that since the turn of the 1990s, the development of digital cultures has helped to amplify this fantasy of the ghost in the machine, bringing the movement of absorption of the medium in the media to its completion. And uh, for me, it's evidenced by films such as Ghost in the Machine, Shutter, White Noise, One Miss Call, Pulse, or the Ring franchise. The exclusion of the spiritual medium in contemporary films is not without consequences because the specters that penetrate the domestic space through the most common devices, such as cell phones, television, automatic answering 
machines, computers, and so on, are particularly terrifying. Whereas in the golden age of spiritualism, technology was put at the service of an ideal of immediate contact with the world of the invisible for the progress of humankind, in our time, technologies, as depicted in horror films, crystallizes fears of the rise of bloodthirsty ghosts rather than hopes of reunion with loved ones. Hopes that were at the core of spiritism, which was uh, never afraid of ghosts. At least it, it, this is the case according to G Horror, where the terror comes from the expulsion of the medium in favor of the soul media. By extracting itself from a television set, the specter of Sadako expresses not only the fear of the domination um, of the machine over humans, but also the uncontrollable proliferation of ghosts via technological devices. This is uh, why today, um, probably, uh, media have replaced the mediums of yesterday without their occult dimension having disappeared in the process. In fact, despite the secularization that defines the term medium, now seen primarily as, means of, as a means of communication, as shown by uh, anthropological studies, such as the excellent work of Ila Voss in Germany, the digital media continue nowadays more than ever to convey specters. This is evidenced uh, by our online, uh, sorry, our online uh, sessions in the context of a pandemic. These sessions are definitely postmodern variation of 19th century seance as illustrated by this uh, man, uh, you surely, surely already know. Uh, it's uh, evidenced also by our social media avatars that shape virtual identities um, that end up haunting the web even after we uh, give up uh, using them or worse die. Uh, it's evidenced also by the whole internet and its GAFAMs uh, play, that play today the role of super powerful mediums that anticipate each of our desire. For sure, algorithms that predict our individual purchasing policies, smart refrigerators that plan our meals, applications that allow us to detect paranormal activities around uh, us, such as the ghost radar, Siri voices that haunt our apartments, the supernatural is absolutely everywhere. Prepared for a long time by the semantic overlap between medium and media, the fusion of the medium and the machine is also largely the work of spiritualism. In fact, although repeatedly proclaiming the superiority of the medium over the media, the spiritual movement has only elaborated a model of post-human subjectivity that will find its way into the 21st century fiction, like shown by the film Transcendence, where once it has been downloaded to a computer, the mind of Will Caster will continue to thrive through an internet connection. By attributing to machines the mission of preserving the souls of the dead or their conscience, spiritualism has left us an imaginary of remote transmission that can be declined ad infinitum. The vanishing or dissolution of the human medium in favor of the media is then emblematic of a proposition that attributes to artificial intelligences the privilege of prolonging our existence, of predicting our future, or of communicating with the ineffable. As a result, today's ghosts no longer arise from the afterlife, from hell, or from the unconscious, but from the technologic technological uh, media and such as uh, a video platform and um, uh, it's a uh, it's a, 
uh, hi to my co-panelist, um, Nicolo Villanis. He will continue. I think I'm, I'm looking forward to, to hear to, to, to him because I think it's uh, um, uh, sort of a prolonging of my, of my own reflection. And uh, so thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mariel, for your presentation. Uh, next, uh, we have um, Sandra Pacheco from the University of Lisbon, who is going to do a presentation on a film by Daniel, uh, um, I can see the name, Blykoff's um, The Absence, uh, which is a film which uh, uh, re-edits uh, the film, the classic film by Jean-Luc Godard, Abu de Soufflé. Um, Sandra, cuando quieras. Yes. Uh, I'm just going to share the screen here. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, can you see the, the screen? Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about uh, Daniel Blaufock's film, uh, The Absence, uh, from 2008. Um, from the moment the opening credits are shown, the reworking of Jean-Luc Godard's A bout du souffle in Blaufock's The Absence becomes evident. Ce film est dédié à la monogram pictures, has been transformed into uh, this jumble of words, which I'm not going to try to pronounce. Inspired by the work of Georges Perec, a contemporary of Godard, like in the French writer's novel, La Disparition, Blafox has removed every E. Abu de Souf has turned into this version, <laughs> which I am yeah, not pronouncing. And the title the artist has given to this project, The Absence, has also suffered a mutilation. So we can see below uh, the absence, the absence has turned into L, A, B, S, and C. Yet, this is not the only excision Godard's film has been submitted to in Blaufuchs's hands. Should one not be familiarized with the 1960s French film, perhaps it might take a few instants before the augmented disjointedness of the film becomes apparent. What causes this disjointedness? Not just Godard's editing, editing technique, not just the jump cuts, the abrupt transitions between film sequences that break continuity, establishing the illusion of a faster pace, yet simultaneously bringing the viewer's attention to film as film. Uh, sorry, I lost the thing. Oops. <laughs> as a medium that came to mark Abu de Soufou as one of the first and more influential examples of French New Wave film. There's something else that appears to be absent from a traditional continuous edit. Jean-Paul Belmondo's character is missing and not just from the hands of the police. In the first 10 minutes of Godard's film, Michel, played by Belmondo, has already stolen an American car, killed a police officer and made his way to Paris to collect money from another small time crook with a cigarette constantly dangling from his lips, which he systematically rubs his tongue across and a hat tipped to one side, Michelle emulates Humphrey Bogart or to be more exact, the characters Bogart has played in American noir films. He meets his American lover, Patricia, played by Jean Seberg and attempts to convince her to escape with him to Italy. In the end, she betrays him to the police. He is shot and dies a prolonged and exaggerated death. In eliminating Michelle, Blaufox turns an 87 minute film into a just over 20 minute short. Patricia, with her short hair and striped clothes, fills the screen time, often looking at or talking to someone just outside the frame. It is this process of looking just outside the frame that Blafox disrupts with his new edit. He disrupts the process of suture. I'm just going to show a small clip from the beginning of the Blafox's reworking. 
I'm not sure if the sound is working or not, but it doesn't really matter if there's sound or not, because it's just the visual part is the most interesting one. Um, okay. Can you hear it? Maybe not. Eu tentei que, um, sorry. Um, eu tentei partilhar no, com, com o copetão e ele disse-me que tinha reiniciar o zoom. Uh, o som não é assim tão, tão necessário neste clipe. Sim, sim, exato. So, developed by Jean, um, Jacques Miller, uh, Jacques Allen Miller, in an intervention in Lacan's 24th of February 1965 seminar, uh, Crucial problem, Problems for Psychoanalysis, the notion of suture was first applied to film by Jean Pierre Audard in his seminal essay, Cinema and Suture from 1969. According to Miller, and I quote, suture names the relation of the subject to the chain of its discourse, end quote. In film, suture is what allows spectators to suspend their disbelief and become absorbed by the film as a realistic and believable depiction. For Odard, suture is found in the shot reverse shot model. The first shot might feature a character looking, on, looking or speaking to an unknown, what is designated as an absent one, breaking the viewer's immersion in the film, who is at the other side of the gaze. Uh, the second shot, corresponding to what is being looked at or addressed, sutures the structure and answers a question. In eliminating Belmondo's character, Lovefox is interrupting this moment of suture. Thus, the absence becomes permanently fixed on the absent one. Like a phantom limb, Michelle's presence remains. It is there in the augmented disjointedness of the film, but it is also there when Patricia looks just beyond the frame and addresses an invisible force. I propose that in this process of excision, Blaufuchs is highlighting Michel's phantasmatic existence as he attempts to live as an imitation of Humphrey Bogart. I'm going to show the little clip about this relationship with Michel and Bogart. Uh, also, the sound is not really relevant because it's just Michel looking at pictures of Bogart. So. And to understand a bit um, what I'm trying to say in regards to Blaufuchs's um, use of um, excision of Michel uh, in relationship to Amphi Burgert, I'm just going to show the um, reworking Blaufuchs makes of the same scene without Michel.
In his film, Blaufuchs maintains this relationship between Michel and Bogart by keeping in a picture of Bogie. Michel's cigarette, cigarette smoke swirling over the image, still like an ethereal presence. Ten years after producing this piece, Blaufuchs wrote a sentiment that might be easily applied to the absence, as it might to the book that first inspired it. He writes, and I quote, might an absence be more present than the presence, end quote. As I mentioned, the missing E in Blaufuchs stems from Georges Perec's La Disparition, a novel grounded on the assistant presence of an absent element. Born in Paris in 1936, Perec was the son of Jewish Polish immigrants. His father, having enlisted in the French Foreign Legion in September 1939, just a few weeks after the invasion of Poland, died of battle wounds in June 1940. As Jews in occupied France, Perec's family quickly saw their rights curtailed. If for a time, young Perec continued to live with his mother and grandparents in Paris, towards the end of 1941, he was placed on a French Red Cross convoy to join relatives in the French Alps. This moment would be the last time Perec would see his mother. On January 1943, she was arrested in a raid, taken to a holding camp in Rancy, and from there sent to Auschwitz, where she disappeared. What was left to Perec of his parents was two certificates, one of his father's death, the other of his mother's Acte de Disparition, or Certificate of Disappearance, since for the French government, her death could never be properly established. Perec was better known as a member of Ulipo, a, group, a work group enthralled by the potentialities of constraints and mathematical possibilities. In this group, the French author became an expert in applying and elaborating his own constraints to a variety of forms, from poetry to short fiction to novels or radio plays to the lipogram, in which a letter is omitted at its most successful when the reader is none the wiser for its disappearance. It is this, this disappearance, this act of disparition, that became the title of one of his principal works. As mentioned uh, in the text, Perec excises the letter E, the most commonly used in the French language. Not only that, the entire book is structured around a reflection of this process of excision. Formally, La Disparition is composed of 26 chapters, or so it might seem. In fact, whilst the chapters are numbered up to 26, the number of letters in the alphabet, chapter five, uh, the position of the letter E is missing. Indeed, a number of elements in the fifth position are absent, as Warren Mott explains, and I quote, Perec mentions a hospital ward with 26 beds, all of them occupied with the ex except, exception of one. A collection of 26 in folio volumes where the fifth volume is missing. A horse race with 26 entrants, one being scratched, and 26 boxes with the fifth being absent." End quote. If in its form, La Disparition is already a feat in itself, the vertiginous sense of unease and fracture experienced by the characters is heightened through their rareness of a missing element in their surroundings. It is this missing piece that becomes the obsession triggering the tale of Anton Vol, or Voyal in the original French, and his companions. Amongst the various proposals for the significance of the missing E, one finds a relationship with one of Perex and Blaufuchs's influences, a man who similarly worked in the fantastic and the phantasmagorical, Jorge Luis Borges. Early on in his novel, Perec writes, and I quote, Staring at his rug in this way starts grating on Val, who, a victim of optical illusions, of sly tricks that his Im imagination is playing on him, starts to fancy that a focal point is at long last within his grasp, though just as it is about to solidify, it sinks again into a void. It's almost as though intrinsic to his rug, to its vitals in a way, is a solitary strand looping around a vanishing point, alpha, 
you might call it, end quote. Whoops, sorry, <laughs> wrong page. The alpha project takes hold of in La Disparition is none other than a variant of Borges' Aleph. In the section I just quoted, there are distinct elements pulled directly from the Argentinian writer's 1945 short story, The Aleph. And now, yeah. Uh, so, and I quote, um, the Aleph was probably two or three centimeters in diameter, but universal space was contained inside it with no diminution in size. Each thing, the glass surface of a mirror, let's say, was infinite things because I could clearly see it from every point of the cosmos, end quote. Moreover, the Aleph itself is at times represented as a single letter, in French taking the shape of E. It has been put forward that in French, E is pronounced as E, which stands for them, leading to the suggestion that the missing E in La Disparition might send in for all the people whose final record is simply an act of disparition, like Perec's mother and the other victims of the Holocaust. As the French writer's biographer, David Ballo notes, in the Go Gollum tale, after creating a golem by inscribing the word emet, meaning truth, on its forehead, the rabbi becomes wary of the creature, asking it to bend over. As it does so, the rabbi erases the aleph, or the first elet, uh, first letter of emet, which leaves death, which, met, which means death. And the golem turns to dust, when he is erasing the Aleph, in truth, the rabbi is erasing the E. So, and I quote Ballos, what has disappeared then from la disparition? He has, they have, those who have the golem to protect them no longer, end quote. In this mutilation of language lies a solemn loss, one the writer only hints at. He does not only not depict his loss, as Pablo Martin Ruiz shows, and I quote, Perec even resorts to a new mutilated language in order not to recount it, end quote. In removing fundamental elements for the construction of the respective medium of choice, the alphabet in Perec's case and the edit in Blaufox, the artist elaborates a process of mutilation of language that might be read as a reflection of the vertiginous narratives they try to convey. Perec with the swift descent into madness, his character suffer. Blaufuchs with the removal of Michel, who not only lives as an imitation of Humphrey Bogart, but belongs to a fading cinematic genre in the 1960s. The B films of Crops on the Run by disappearing production companies such as Monogram Pictures. Companies that were so quickly vanishing that they would induce an, hom an homage by Godard. And so I uh, would like to end this presentation on a proposal that perhaps the ghost was at the beginning of the film all along and Blaufuchs' missing E might also point, point to the passing of a film culture that determined the, determined the works of both Godard and Perec. Um, that's it. Thank you. Gotcha. Okay, um, we have here our third presentation by um, Nicole uh, Villani, uh, which um, is going to focus on uh, the relationship between the spectator and the algorithm in um, in Netflix uh, from the context of the the, um, the platform of Netflix. Um, okay, Nicole, whenever you want. Okay, you're seeing my screen, I guess. Okay, good evening everyone and welcome to my presentation. Let me thank you all for this opportunity to present you this very early phase of my ongoing research on theoretical models to apply on a phenomenological approach to streaming platforms. 
I'm Nicola Villani. I am a PhD student in medium and mediality at eCampus University in Italy. One of my main interests is the contemporary media environment and its phenomenological and structural conditions in meaning, functions, interaction, and identity configuration. As you can see on the screen today, I'm going to talk to you about the many kinds of ghosts that attend the streaming platforms in different and various ways, giving interesting new models to, interp the, to interpret the interaction between the OTTs and their users, both individual and collective. This topic is of particular interest for those that attack the streaming platforms market in order to have brand new models to study audiences, screens, fruition practices, and user involvement. The model I'm going to present to you is also of interest for those who appreciate the theoretical speculation, the phenomenological debate, and the modern results of structuralism. The path of my presentation is divided in different parts, like different haunted rooms in which we are going to find the various ghosts that move the furnishing of OTT's homes. We will start from the actual infestation of products that brings haunted houses within the streaming catalogs, a huge image of the haunting discourse through movies and series, where we will distinguish between two kinds of models of ghosts, the phantom and the specter, useful to interpret elements of the users, the home pages, and the algorithms. In the end, we will deeply observe how the specter can be a finer model than the classical simulacrum used to define the audience by age, gender, and social position. For Ghosts as Plan, I'd hope to give you an image of how many ghosts surround us while we use Netflix, Amazon, and so on. Since this is the start of ongoing research, I'd really, I'd really be thankful to anyone who would, who would, have, who would have questions, observation, or objection on what I'm going to present. As we can see in the screenshot, oh, I'm sorry. As you can see in the screenshot, I recently took writing the word phantasma, the Italian word for ghost, in the search bar of the three main global OTT platforms, Netflix, Amazon Prime Video, and Disney Plus. Amazon Prime Video and Disney Plus, the streaming catalogs are full of products with, with phantoms, ghosts, and hunting houses in their plots. Starting from the classical family movies like Ghostbusters and Casper, going through the anthological series The Hunting and horror movies like Ghost Stories, Hunted, The Others, The Orphanage. Netflix is a true neighbor of haunted houses through any genre, even animation. Amazon is no exception. With series like American Horror Story, the cult movie Phantasm, products about the paranormal as ESP, the eye, the presence, and ghost, and ghost hunters. Curiously, even Disney Plus has many rooms full, full of ghosts, especially regarding Disney products more than star ones. The Anton Mansion, The Scream Team, The Ghosts of Buxley Hall, Phantom of the Megaplex, and even a short movie with Tom Meter, Meter and the Ghost Light. My, my hypothesis is that we can read this huge population of hunted products in the stream platforms catalogs as the image of a layered discourse of themselves and of their own functioning in a metaphorical and operational way. Different aspects of the meaning effect of algorithm working are just spectral figures of different subjectivities involved in the daily user experience. So let's enter the haunted neighbor of the OTTs to discover which kind of ghosts operate before and after the media fruition. We can distinguish two different phantas phantasmic figures in action within the streaming platform. According with the theories behind the identification and formalization, we will distinguish between phantoms and specters in a classification that is as much semantical as operational. Normally, these terms are synonyms, but we propose to construct a taxonomy between themselves to introduce an actual phenomenology of ghosts within the streaming platforms. Actually, this could appear as, as a very specific ambit in which introduce a phenomenological debate, but according with Husserl's original proposal, in, a, in specific subject, we can introduce an effective epoche which can lead to a more general and theoretical model of intersubjective interaction. So let's grab, grab our PKE meter and go to discover the ectoplasm around us. In a recent essay, the Italian media scholar Giorgio Abetsu proposes a site on what he calls the phantom of the machine to observe how the apparently automatic and self-regulating mechanism of streaming platforms algorithms have actually a strong subjective presence of stream directions. Distinguishing between two main kinds of algorithms, content-based and collaborative filtering, on which we will return after, Avetsu affirms that these two mechanisms can act without the subjective regulation. 
To have a content-based mechanism, the products have to be tagged, analyzed, and put in relation to themselves, distinguishing significant elements and aspects that convey the meaning of each movie and series. This work of the this work of deconstruction and classification is a subjective work and edit, an editorial one, and that needs a direction and a, and a management, creating a contextual organization in which the same product in different platforms configures different different effects. The collaborative filtering mechanism as well needs to be regulated because the reticles created by users or by their specters that we will see are not sufficient to create a coherent flow of contents because the size of the user's acti activities and the constant variation of the catalogs. According with Avetsu, we call this subjective figure the phantom of all streaming platforms. An, invis an invisible figure we checked upstream, which know every single room of the OTT building and can maintain the order within the catalog, according with the editorial views, view. As happens in many ghost stories, the phantom is the butler of those houses, strictly related with its identity and existence, which organize the movements of the other subjects through the, room, through the rooms. Regardless of uh, whether this ghost is a single individual, an editorial team, or anything else, what is here of interest is the subjectivity effect acting behind the scenes of me mechanical function of the algorithm. The phantom is the invisible hand which permits the illusion of an automatic and neat flow of recommended contents. It's now, time to, it's now time to identify the ghostly figure enacted by the users while they explored and watch products within the streaming platform context. Traditionally, according with the Nielsen meter method, the television audiences are summarized in large blocks of stereotypical figures, theoretically identifiable with the semiotical category of simulacrum. Far from being a true subjective figure, the simulacrum is the configuration of the expectation of someone built from generic data and previous experiences. In the audiovisual context, those generic data are the age, the gender, the social position of different categories of audiences used for the segmentation of time slots to build the television schedules. Obviously, ob obviously, obviously, I'm sorry, the simulacrum figure is not enough to register the streaming platform user's practices. We propose here to extrapolate the notion of Spectre as Jacques Derrida configures in his seminal book, Spectres of Marx. Focusing not on the Marxist aspects, but on the identification of the Spectre as an analytical figure, we, we, we find it it is a very specific kind of a simulacrum with the actual component of subjectivity, which is the source of emanation of the spectral figure. According with Derrida, the specter is the meaning effect of the action of a subject, the result of, of a dialogue that puts in shape the trace of intentions during time. Every action occurring within the streaming platforms affect the position of the products inside every single home page, user by user. And this position is the trace of the presence of the spectatorial specter. This specter is not a mirror of the user, as not an ontological gender or age, but is structured by its consumer practices. The specter of an adult male can appear as a teenage boy because it's media habits. This happens because the platform is part of this spectral emanation. The specter is summoned by the intersubjective interaction between the platform and the user, an ethical interaction which changes the media environment at every touch of the screen. The Rida, starting from the Hamlet, describes the specter as equipped with, hem with helmet with visor, through which it can observe and notice, and notice the subjects, the Rida says the body, the ontological person, as the platform does through the specter of its user, collecting data in a constant discourse. The helmet is the screen through which we explore the home page, an effective haunted house, haunted house where the user can lost itself leaving spectral traces during the media fruition. The specter acts with, within his house, changing its furnishing, action by action, unseen if not in its effects. But every OTT platform is made by countless houses, countless home pages, hunted one by one by different specters, each one regulated by an univocal phantom butler, whose actions determine changing in other home pages. This is because the collaborative filtering aspect of the algorithms, which returns the meaning effect of a hunted neighbor of hunted houses. Every home page has a specter, as we said, but the home page of the same OTT are not isolated one from one. The actions of my specter is not only it, it not 
of my sweater not only affects my own page, but creates movements inside other user ones, like an invisible guest that moves objects unseen and probably uninvited. This is the reason of the necessity of the phantom butler previous described, because every OTT has an editorial direction that can't be dissolved by the action of its population of specters. We'd like to underline that the relationship between the users, the platform, the phantom, and the various specters is not of, in, of the order of dialect, dialectics. There's not negation of anything, nor synthesis or compromise. Between every single subjectivity involved in this ghost story, we find what Francois Julien calls a card, not a gap, but an actual between, the fertile condition of movement and adjustment that produces a constant meaning within, the, within an effect of intersubjectivity. The Ridagos theory underlines the legacy aspect between the action of the specter. Every specter, as we said, is a bridge between a past and a future, an inconsistence and ineffable image of a presence out of joint. But now we know that the specter is, an, is never alone. The phantom supervises the its action and it has to relate with other subjectivities, which are the specters, always past, even in the present moment of other of, of users. The social semiologist Eric Landowski, in his formalization of the interaction regimes, puts this effect of mutual and extended inter intersubjectivity under the name of, of adjustment, in which every subject involved has to adjust his actions in order to follow the others. This adjustment happens around the ECAR configured by the actions of every single ghost that inhabits the streaming platform. Between the own pages, between the recommendations, between the preferences, and between the whole amount of, of an ever changing catalog and the image of, uh, of it that appears through the own page itself. Actually, this notion of image is the ultimate ghost figure, an action within the streaming platforms. The own page is never the same, although it is always recogniz recognizable with a flow, fluid but coherent identity. This image is the definitive result of an action of the ghosts, both phantom and specters. This image is the meaning in its own giving, the effect of a, of a collective and never-ending discourse. This brings me to the end of my ectoplasmic journey. To conclude, let me summarize the main points of this very actual ghost stories. First, we looked at the catalogs of the three main global streaming platforms, underlying how many products convey a story within ghosts as haunted, uh, and haunted houses. Then, we considered the model of a haunted mansion as a metaphor of the, uh, to describe the meaning effects of the user's practices within the OTTs, distinguishing between two kinds of ghostly figures, the phantom and the specter. So we watch those figures one by one, focusing on the intersubjective interactions that underlies their actions. In the end, many new problems appear on this ghostly path. First of all, how can we catch this final ghost, the image of the meaning resulting by all those interactions? And then if we can actually distinguish so many subjective figures involved in the stream platform practices, how can we account for the psychoanalytic dynamics implicit in their configuration, especially the problem of the unconscious? Is there a sort of psychoanalysis of ghosts? And can it be applied on the machine that the algorithm, the algorithm is? Many questions are open for the to answer too, but right now, let me thank you all for your attention. And as I said in the beginning, I'm here for any question or observation you might have. Thank you. Thank you very much for these uh, very interesting um, presentations. Um, I would like to, to open if, um, well, we already have a question. <laughs> Someone had a question. Um, it's for, for Miguel. Uh, so, uh, my question is for Michel. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for the excellent uh, presentation. Uh, I made some notes and I hope that I can align my thoughts correctly so this doesn't turn too confusing. So, uh, as you were talking about this theory of the bioplasm universe, uh, I couldn't stop thinking about this film by Xu Bing called Dragonfly Eyes. Uh, that basically is comprised of uh, this, this, it's a montage of all this CCTV footage 
mm. that um, in a certain way offers this panoramic show that you were talking about. But afterwards, I started thinking about this <laughs> TV show about ghost hunting from arts and entertainment. And uh, in a moment, they were filming this house with all this digital equipment. And when they were about to check the, the footage, they noticed that a part of the, of the moment wasn't captured because they said that the ghostly uh, presence in a certain way stopped the, the recording. Um, but after this thought, I remember the documentary that I saw a lot of years ago um, about these um, documentary filmmakers that went to Chernobyl uh, some decades after the, the nuclear incident. Um, and they, they, they used all this uh, film, these physical film cameras uh, that did not stop filming uh, at all the moments, but carried with them the, this nuclear waste that turned into disease for all the people involved. It was not that they're going to Chernobyl that killed them, it was all the, this process of montage with the film afterwards when they returned to, to their respective countries that gave them the, the diseases that killed them. So my question is, if, um, do you see the digital, as you talked about, mm -hmm. as a, a more effective uh, mm -hmm. uh, medium but in a way, in a safer gateway for this spectral or ghostly communication. And I mean safer, uh, as in uh, like with less risks to, to the human medium in a certain way. Thank you so much. Mm. Um, it's a, a very good uh, question. And I, I'm not sure I'm able really to, to answer because uh, the examples you, you gave, uh, I, I, I don't know that, but um, it's... Um, I, watching all these movies with uh, ghosts and mediums, um, I was um, wondering why low tech is always coming over and over. The, the parapsychologist and medium, as in Insidious, for instance, you, you probably know the movies, are always using low tech technologies and not so much digital technologies. So I was wondering why. Uh, and one of my thoughts was to think that um, uh, probably uh, it is because um, low tech technology, anal um, analog technology is uh, really linked to the recording of a past uh, with this idea that for instance, cinema is uh, the best tool to record and keep um, the memory of the loved ones. And uh, I also do some research on uh, people using uh, technological uh, devices to um, try to um, uh, record uh, supernatural presence. And um, they, they, they told me, talking with them, that um, digital technologies are much better to record because you can uh, manipulate um, much better uh, the, um, the recording. So um, I think digital in theory would be much better, uh, more practical and more um, effective in recording uh, um, ghostly presence. But in the cinema, it's the contrary. Uh, they are not used to capture ghosts. They are, uh, it's the ghosts who use digital technology to hunt um, the, the living. So uh, it's, I wonder always why uh, technology is always, digital technologies are always uh, come as a, a vehicle to hunt and also uh, to um, persecute persecuted, um, uh, living, living. And so uh, that's my, my answer. And I will think about that. Thank you for the very good question. It's too late for my book now, but um, thank you. Um, any other questions? No. Um, I have some, some reflections because when I was listening to you, um, I 
came um, it came to me a text by Maxim Gorky when he first Maxim Gorky when he watched um, the the famous films by by the Lumiere the train arriving to the station and he wrote the text which came uh, to me now uh, which I read a long time ago and he was uh, looking at the film like uh, uh, precisely like ghosts he was looking at the at the people who were uh, in the screen as ghosts as um, something really strange and, and weird for him in a way which was not very positive as i remember the text uh, um, the thing is that um, one of the things I, I felt when I read the test, and I'm feeling now as well when I listen to your presentation, is that cinema has in itself a dream quality. And, I, and also, when I watch a film, I also have an experience uh, similar to a dream. I mean, I'm dreaming when I'm watching a film in a certain way. And I think, uh, I, I'm saying this because there are things that are coming to my mind when I was listening to your presentations in different ways. Uh, when I thought about Sandra's, I felt about the absence. Um, when I watch a film, I always feel automatically an absence. And it kind of uh, reminds me of well of work because you can remove um, Michelle from the film, but even if you don't remove it, you know that he's not there anymore. And there is always a nostalgic, melancholic, actual uh, absence in, in any film because uh, cinema is the art of the past. It doesn't exist after your film it stops existing, in a way. And these different qualities the, or experience, uh, I don't know, I, I saw through in, in your three presentations, I felt also very close when I was listening to Nicolo about the Netflix and about how it works, how the algorithms have a dialogue with us and personalize our viewing experience, but it's much more than that. And we are not aware of that, of that ghostly presence, even though we are interacting with them in a, an unconscious manner, which kind of reflects as well to that kind of dream experience, how, um, how I let go in front of this uh, in front of this platform, and I let myself go the same way I let go when I'm watching a film. Uh, when I'm watching a film, I get into into a dream experience where I let go and I believe. And, and, we, and you were talking about special effects and um, or talking about insidious, and I thought. Uh, you can use technology to represent that uh, past, no? That, 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 that. Um, and you can have now great effects to represent somebody coming out of a screen, like the film of The Ring of uh, Verbonsky, uh, to create those goals that they, they, they manage from, from the technology. Uh, but at the same time, you don't need any of that, because uh, I think people, we want to believe. And this is why we let go and we watch a film with our open eyes and we dream. And we just want to believe. And because we are, uh, we are bound to believe, we just get in, into whatever. Um, I was remembering uh, my daughter today playing at home. She's sick and she was playing with some things. And she doesn't need anything to, to watch a film. She just automatically is into her universe, into her film. And, uh, you know, he comes in and out with uh, an amazing capacity to, 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 to dream. No? And I think, uh, anyway, these are reflections. I don't know if you have any comments on that. It's just things that you made me thought about. Uh, and I was writing here, I have lots of notes about what you were talking about. And uh, kind of made me dream as well about many things that, that were coming to my mind. And I, um, um, I just wanted to put them out here before I... I forget or I, 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 uh, I don't say it correctly. And I don't know if you have any comments that you want to say, Nicolo or Sandro or uh, um, um, Michel. Yeah, um, so yeah, I agree. Uh, the relationship you talk about in relate uh, of the Gorky and the shadows uh, of film Yes, Blofox does work uh, with that notion of um, shadows or, or uh, things that fade after um, passing. Um, so as, as José Bertel mentions um, in his own lecture, which I think he quote, quoted Gork here as well, um, when, film, when the film ends, um, it's no longer there. There's an absence afterwards. Um, so yes, uh, this um, removal of a character kind of plays with the whole notion of film itself, um, not only in how the edit is made, but also um, how um, film then leaves us with this um, kind of spectral um, 
condition afterwards. I don't know, Nicole, in, perhaps you could talk a little bit. How do you think uh, people are aware or not feel about this, uh, I don't know if we can call it unconscious relationship they have with these platforms? Uh, how do you feel about that? It's a very interesting question, a very interesting aspect of my research because, you know, uh, starting from a phenomenological point of view, uh, you have to consider the embodiment aspect we actually touch many of the screens we are interacting with. Uh, we are giving a body to those spectral figures. You know, uh, in, in a tablet, you touch the product you want to see. So there is a, a very physical interaction, a very strong physical interaction, an ethical one, because every uh, choose you make changes the environment you are, uh, you are in. But, but also, uh, you can pass a lot of, lot of minutes not choosing anything just watching the catalog, just talking with the catalog, uh, asking the catalog what she has in itself. So it, it's really this uh, sort of solipsistic dialogue between a subject that interacts with you and the same mom interacts with many other users and uh, put in contact with uh, solipsistic subjects uh, in an unaware um, structure of subjectivities. We, we actually don't know many people uh, in this moment are watching something on Netflix or uh, or in Netflix, uh, only the phantom knows it, you know, the, the other spectral figure which uh, put in order everything that happens in the catalog. Um, this is really curious. You, you are in a room with many masked figures so you can't see the, figure them, the figures themselves. There's a strong, a scaring uh, spectral, uh, uh, situation. Yes, this is one thing that I was thinking um, because we we like the fact that this happened to us. Uh, what I mean is that we like that the algorithm is there and changes things because it doesn't become so boring and it becomes more attractive and they discover different things and have an interaction and that. But also, to me, uh, uh, there is another thing about delegating much of our choice or our fantasy choice that we have about what we can consume or do or no on the algorithm no? and uh, on the which is something uh, i don't know i think something is quite an important subject nowadays in the sense that more and more algorithms are taking uh, care of many things that we don't know, like when you do a search in the Amazon or, or in the Google Drive or whatever, there are a number of algorithms that they play a big role in terms of things that we do. More than that, they know everything about us. No? Yeah. Uh, they know, they can know digital, no? the digital or the power of the digital or the algorithm, they can know exactly much more than we know about us ourselves because they can process a huge amount of information very quickly. And the same thing happens with these platforms when you were exposing here the type of users, what they do or, or not, how we classify them, what kind of information about the way they interact unconsciously. I don't know if I'm making myself much very clear about this, no, but I think. No, no, no. Uh, it, 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 it's actually very clear. Uh, it, you know, it's one of the main discourses between this uh, this algorithm functioning in our everyday life. But in the audiovisual aspects, I'm, I'm not so uh, apocalyptic because uh, even before Netflix, before all this streaming platform, hmm. there was uh, a, a subject behind uh, uh, our choosing. You know, you go to the theater, you want to see a movie, you don't have hmm. uh, an infinite choice of movies, even in a, a multi screen situation you have about 10 14 uh, movies in the greatest theater you can imagine so somebody uh, chose the movies for you put the movies in the distribute in the distribution process and you have to choose between a very specific catalog in that precise moment so uh, i don't know it, it, it's no uh, a big issue because uh, netflix never want to know uh, the specific data of us. You never uh, Netflix never ask you your age, never ask you your genre, your, your gender, never ask you your social position. Uh, it deducts that uh, by your uh, user experience, but deducts your user age, your user uh, gender, your user social position. I can actually I, I'm a boy, but I can see a lot of girl uh, girlish 
products and Netflix thinks about me as a girl, not as, not as a boy, because they never ask me if I am a boy. This is the, uh, the, the crucial part of this uh, data, data and algorithm issue. It's not something about the ontological us, it's something about uh, our user us. This is the passage. Could I ask something to Nicolo? Sure, yes, of course. Yes. Um, uh, you, uh, don't you think that uh, the, pl the platforms, the VOD uh, platforms such as uh, Netflix are also um, super medium? They are ghosts, uh, but also mediums. And it's very interesting because I never thought about uh, uh, what you say. Um, I, I see uh, them upon it only as a super medium who can predict our desires and and tastes and 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 that make me think about the affinity finally between ghost and medium because both are figures um, um, of uh, in between figures uh, intermediate figures uh, you know uh, what I mean so what what do you think about that. Yeah, yes, uh, I think the Netflix is an uh, entertainment, entertainment experience itself. Uh, uh, mm. I'd like to, um, to put the, the discourse on Disney+, Plus, which is a clearer image of that, because mm -hmm. Disney+, Plus is a sort of Disneyland an mm. in an audiovisual way. You know, you have many, mm. uh, many mm. attractions, which mm. are the movies, but mm. never goes away from the catalog. Disney mm. has that and never puts them away and as many sections which are the thematical areas in which you can go uh, experience the, right. uh, the attraction uh, this is a sort of uh, entertainment environment mm. you are uh, you are experiencing while, while you watching netflix non the product of netflix while you watching disney plus non the products in disney plus uh, yes this is uh, a, a customer experience because it is organized around you just like mm. you go to your favorite uh, bar or local and you ask the the usual drink the, the bartender knows your usual drink can mm. suggest you another drink which is like your usual drink or it's a new drink which uh, he has both because you like your usual drink and something like that uh, it's a sort of mm. customer experience built around you mm. and built because of every customer on this in this experience just like a theme park um, thank you very much. Uh, I'm afraid we don't have any more time for more questions. Uh, it was a pleasure. Thank you very much for your presentations. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Um, I just want to uh, take this um, time to thank everybody that supported the, this conference, uh, special technical team that made this possible, this offline, online conference, and also the people that were here with masks all, all day, uh, hearing and asking questions. Um, it was very good. And now for the ending of, of the conference, only offline, not the, for the people, <laughs> Uh, at home, only offline we'll, we will have the opening of the um, exhibition by Nuno Serra at the exhibition room of Escola das Artes. It was a pleasure to have you um, around the world and we see you next May for the next spring seminar. Bye. <laughs>